Hello, everyone. My name is Katie Liskey, and I am a marketing analyst at Entity Data Federal. Today, we will be hearing from Nat Bongiovanni about a pragmatic, practical approach to cybersecurity, also known as Apple. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat, and we will get to them in the Q&A session at the end. Now over to you, Nat. Thank you, Katie. Um, so today's presentation is about an ebook that I wrote with Marta Zernike last year called An Apple a Day Keeps Ransomware at Bay. My objective for this presentation is that the audience will better understand what the Apple acronym means and provide some focus on, well, what should my organization be working on if it's a you know, following that that acronym, and then also, how do I communicate better with my peers and leadership? The the goal for this is how do I communicate better? With that, let's move. Let's get started. Um, so, who's NTT Data? So, NTT Data is a large multinational IT service provider, but that doesn't really give a good handle on what it is. I think our global CEO Abhijit Dubey said it best in a recent town hall when he said that NTT data helps our clients responsibly reinvent themselves in an ever-changing world. And I think that's a really great way to describe it because we're an IT services provider that is really the full stack from everything from the, the hardware all the way up to how do you perform your mission or your business. But this talk is about cybersecurity and NTT data does cybersecurity but cybersecurity isn't the goal or the focus. Cybersecurity is a component in a solution that helps the clients responsibly reinvent themselves. And as such, we want to take a focus on how to do that as efficiently as possible. So let me quickly talk about NTT Data Federal because it's important for our discussion. Um, NTT Data Federal is a proxy mitigated subsidiary of NTT Data and it's governed by the Foreign Ownership Control and Influence Act. NTT Data is a Japanese company, and NTT Data Federal has people with security clearances. What does that mean? Well, it means that myself and my team and most of the people in this organization have uh, a U.S. government clearance, like a top secret or a secret, and it also means that we have a bunch of special rules that we have to abide by in doing that. But who am I? Okay. We've already introduced me as Nat Bonjavani, and I'm the Chief Technology Officer, the Chief Information Officer, and the Technology Control Officer, a man of many hats. Um, so let me talk about those roles real quickly. The Chief Technology Officer, I have a solution team that works for me. They have three primary goals. The first goal being help clients achieve their mission or objectives. They're a pool of very qualified, very smart people that do that. The second goal is help us with our business development efforts, whether that's writing a proposal response to an RFP, writing white papers, or presenting to clients about the technology capabilities that we have. And third, we do research. And with the goal for the research is to figure out how we can um, you understand what's coming in technology and then be able to better position ourselves to be able to introduce that technology to our clients. I'm also a chief information officer, and that role exists because of that proxy mitigation uh, and for the, the Foreign Ownership Control and Influence Act. Fundamentally, one of the rules is we have to manage all of our IT separately from our affiliate, primarily to protect classified data. Um, I have an IT team that works for me. They're really exceptional in the way they do things. Um, and I really like it because as the chief technology officer, I get exposed to a lot of really good technologies and we try them out in our own IT department because I really believe in drinking our own champagne. I'm also the technology control officer, and that's a role that's very tightly tied to the chief information officer. And it's a requirement from the Defense Counterintelligence Security Agency in our agreement, uh, the, the agreement with NTT Data. And that role basically means that I'm responsible for ensuring that all of the technology we use meets those foci mitigation rules. Just a little bit more about me. I have broad experience, not only in a wide array of industries, but I've also been in a, a, a whole lot of different roles. I've been an app developer. I've been an architect. I've been a project manager, a program manager, a policy developer, and even an air, air conditioning mechanic. 
And I take all of the, the experiences that I've gained from all of those things that I've done to help inform my, my roles as a, an executive, whether it's a chief technology officer and I'm consulting with clients, or whether a chief information officer making decisions about my own environment and how to best run it. Moving on, what is Apple? Well, Apple is an acronym for Authenticate, Patch and Update, Protect Resources, Limit Privilege, and Enable Anti-Malware. And it's designed to be easy to remember. In the mid-aughts, I worked at the Office of Secretary of Defense for uh, Acquisition Technology and Logistics. And in that role, I worked in developing policies for unique identification um, with a senior executive in the DOD. And her approach to getting this uh, policy implemented was to try and keep things as simple as possible and as, use as clear and concise language as possible so that we were communicating what is it that we exactly wanted to get done and how to get it done. And what I learned in that experience was that clear communication really helps in communicating to people outside of the experts in the field. And so that's what this is really about, is how do we communicate beyond just the experts in the field? Um, so why did I write the ebook? Well, so the ebook was born out of frustration. And the frustration was really from two different aspects. The first frustration is, is I talked to, in the last 10 years, I've talked to a lot of different clients. And often those clients were, they were spending a considerable amount of money on cybersecurity, but they were leaving big holes in their basic cyber hygiene. And I, I didn't understand why that was, but I think what I found was that part of it is the way that the cybersecurity industry operates. So most cybersecurity is sold using fear, uncertainty, and doubt. It was, we talk about how things go wrong. And with most vendors, what you're gonna do is talk about how things go wrong that their product or service fixes. What that does is it creates a fragmented approach. And that fragmented approach ends up leaving holes in the pattern. Interestingly enough, in all the people that I've talked to, I've only run into like two agencies where I got done talking about basic cyber hygiene and I felt like they'd covered the entire gamut of essentially what is Apple. So the goal here was to say, well, how do we how do we drive that? And then, so then it goes to the second problem. And the second problem is kind of an actuarial problem. So let me explain that a little bit. In the insurance industry, there's these groups called these people that are called actuaries. Actuaries look at risks and figure out the probability that a risk will occur and what is the impact of that risk financially. And then from those two things, they generate a, uh, a premium that would be charged to the, the consumer or whoever's purchasing the insurance. We've all experienced this. Anybody who's had a child that just started driving or just started driving themselves knows that that first year, the car insurance for the, per for the new driver is really high. And the reason for that is that new drivers are much more likely to get in an accident than seasoned drivers. And the pricing for the insurance reflects that. And we really need something like that for cybersecurity. So I look at the cybersecurity problem as an asymptote. And so let me get into this a little bit. So obviously I use mathematics a lot. Um, and I've been using mathematics in my career, whether it's determine the probability that a neutron will hit an atom, or whether the probability that a particular data set is correct. So that math has informed the way I've approached my career the entire time. And because I'm familiar with mathematics, I looked at the problem of cybersecurity and cybersecurity protection as an asymptote. And so let me explain this graph a little bit. On the red line, there, you can get 100% protection against cybersecurity attacks. We know how to do that. All we have to do is shut off all of our electronic devices. If they don't have any electrons, they're not at risk. They can't be hacked. But obviously, the cost of doing that is infinite. It means that we can't be in business. It's not an acceptable solution. But as we approach that 100%, the cost of doing it gets um, very expensive. But there's another part of the asymptote that we don't really look at and we don't talk about a lot. And that is that a lot of what we need to do for basic cybersecurity hygiene is the same things we would do for our baseline infrastructure cost. And so that asymptote, the other part, which runs almost parallel to the baseline infrastructure cost for the, the entire line, that that is something that we can focus on of how do we get the most cybersecurity for the least 
um, cost above that basic infrastructure cost. So we kind of understand this in a generic sense because anybody who's um, purchased a house that, or built a house and that house was built to code and the and it was inspected appropriately, what you find is that the house is safe to live in. And that's because we've already figured out what all the big risks were and we've mitigated them for houses. And we need to do the same thing for cybersecurity um, going forward. And so let's talk about that a little bit more. So I'm gonna start with authenticate or authentication. And it turns out that authentication or credential failure is the most common method of being breached. It, it is how most organizations have their environments compromised. And the reason is that there are many, many organizations that aren't using strong authentication measures. And when I say strong authentication measures, I'm talking about like phishing resistant multi-factor authentication or pass keys, or there's a number of technologies that can be used to have much better authentication of people. But we also really need to be authenticating more than people. We should be de authenticating devices and the technology to do that exists. And with by authenticating devices, we can then make sure that the devices are safe for our sensitive resources and data. I also like the idea of authenticating places. And I, I'm gonna use an example for that. Um, so for NTT Data Federal, all, almost everybody in the organization has a security clearance. And when you have a security clearance, one of the things that you need to do before you travel to a foreign country, whether it's for business or vacation, is that you need to submit paperwork, uh, essentially requesting permission and uh, telling the government that you're going to be traveling outside the country. And most of the time people do that. And in fact, it's much more common now than it was just a couple of years ago. And part of the reason for that is that NTT Data Federal IT Department watches where our devices are. And when we detect that a device has gone to a foreign country, we do a check and say, well, did they have permission to take the device to a foreign country? Or, and more importantly, did they have permission to go to a foreign country? And if the answer to either of those questions is no, we freeze the device. And that device can no longer be used until they get back to the US. This substantially reduces the risk of that device being compromised, but it also becomes a learning lesson for the person involved that they need to be able to do the paperwork that goes with having their security clearances in a timely manner. So the next letter in the Apple acronym is patch and update. And I had an entire talk track about patch and update that I had done that I really needed to redo based on what happened last week um, with the CrowdStrike technology, global technology outage. And so, Patching an update is really important. In the CrowdStrike instance, what really became visible is that you need to have a real good strategy for how do you roll out patches. And in talking with a couple of organizations, what we discovered or what we found was that there's a there's a, a, an approach of doing a patch to a smaller group of personnel that are more sophisticated uh, technically, and so that in the event that something goes wrong, that you can then go back and fix it really quickly before you roll it out to the rest of your organization. Um, for doing that with CrowdStrike might have been difficult, but the reality is we need to have a way of protecting ourselves from vendors that don't do patches correctly or don't do the quality assurance correctly. There's a lot more that needs to be found from CrowdStrike before we know exactly what happened. But we need to do patching because the second most common way for organizations to be compromised is through vulnerable software. And the big problem here isn't that things are being patched too quickly. The big problem is they're not being patched fast enough. And in fact, in the Verizon 2024 data breach investigations report, they do a time to patch statistics. This is the time it takes from when a patch is available till a certain percentage of those organizations are the software that's visible on the internet is patched. And 50% of software is patched at 50 day, 55 days. Now, what that means is that there's 50% of the software that's not patched at 55 days. And if we take this out to a year, we find that even after a year, 20% of the software visible on the internet isn't patched. And that patch is a new attack vector for our adversaries and the hackers. And so we, we wanna find a way to prevent them from getting in through known vulnerabilities, and we're gonna to have to be doing those patches faster. 
And when I talk about patches, I'm not just talking about patching servers. We need to be patching laptops, desktops, and mobile devices. And oh, by the way, one of the things we can do with this patching is going back to that authentication is we can say when we do authentication is, is this device patched appropriately? And so if somebody's trying to lo log in with a laptop where the patches haven't been updated appropriately, we can deny them access to sensitive data at a minimum or deny them access to data entirely. And in fact, in NTT Data Federal, one of the things we do is if uh, our laptops or desktops aren't patched in a timely fashion, um, we will then freeze the device and ask the person to come into the help desk so that we can have the help desk ensure that all of the patches are implemented. Moving on to the next um, letter in the Apple acronym is protect resources. And realistically, this is a difficult, this is hard to do. And it's hard to do for two reasons. The, the, the per first reason is when we say protect resources, what we're talking about is protecting those things that the ransomware and extortion extortionists are most after. That would be the sensitive data in our organization, whether that's PII, healthcare related information, intellectual property, et cetera. And so part of the problem is knowing where it's at. It's the, the knowing what we're trying to protect and knowing where it is on our networks. And so let me talk about that a little bit um, in, in explanation. I, I was talking to a chief information security officer a couple of weeks ago. And in talking to that chief information security officer, I, I was bringing up that protecting the resources is a really tough thing to do. And the, that person was very adamant that they had control of all of their sensitive data. And I said, well, do you know if any of that sensitive data got put into a spreadsheet, into a access database, into a PowerPoint, into a Word document? And oh, by the way, do you know where those things are? Are they, are they all in uh, well-guarded access controlled areas or are they sitting on somebody's OneDrive or perhaps a, a rogue SharePoint site or, or maybe even a box or Dropbox cloud sharing platform. So unfortunately, the, the information tends to sprawl and I wasn't trying to make life difficult for that chief information security officer. What I was trying to do is highlight the fact that getting a handle on this is difficult. Now, the good news is Zero, Zero Trust is a response to this problem. And in fact, Zero Trust is actually designed to start solving this problem. And because of that, there are some really good tools that are coming on online that help fix this. And the tools are really kind of in two categories. There's the tools that will help you find sensitive data on your network, and they're getting really good primarily because of the incorporation of artificial intelligence. And so they'll be able to go through your network and look for things that look like their sensitive, sensitive resource, resources are the, essentially the organization's crown jewels. And not only will they find them, but they will attach labels to them. And by attaching labels to them, we now have an ability to start corralling that information into the appropriate areas. And the other thing we can do is we can leverage known protocols like role-based access control, conditional access control, and attribute-based access control in a way that starts providing our, us an ability to micro-segment our networks or micro-segment our environments, whether that's in SharePoint, whether that's on a, a, a local area network drive, um, or whatever ways that we are using for collaboration, we can find ways to protect that sensitive data by putting the appropriate access control in it. And because we've got it labeled, we can start compartmentalizing it better and putting it into the correct compartments and moving it along in that manner. So the next letter in the Apple acronym is limit privilege. What is the difference between protect resources and least privilege? And see, in fact, Limit privilege and protect resources are both functions of authorization. And you think, well, why are, the, why are you splitting them apart? And the, the simple answer is protecting resources is hard, at least privilege shouldn't be. And so let's talk about privilege and how is it limited. So if we define a, a privilege as the ability to grant or deny access to protect, deny or grant access to others for a broad set of capabilities, think root, admin, network admin, DBA, super user, et cetera, 
um, and that's that's elevated privilege, then there should be very few people that actually have those privileges because very few people actually need them. Um, and so the, the, if we know that there's a small group of people, then we can also then train those people to further protect privilege by using things like um, privileged access management, by using alternate IDs, or by doing uh, standard training on only using those elevated privileges when they're absolutely necessary, and other than that, using our standard privilege accounts for everything we do. And just as a point of reference, in at NTT Data Federal, I have a list of everyone who has uh, elevated privileges. Um, and I can look over that list and I know who all those people are. Um, and it's less than 2% of the organization. It's not a big list for me to manage. And, and that is a, a goes a long way for preventing the blast radius of a uh, exploit from becoming worse. Um, enabling anti-malware, and again, it is not lost on me that CrowdStrike's anti-malware was the, the cause of the global outage. That said, CrowdStrike's software was really good at preventing known exploits. Um, and so most of the exploits using malware are already known. And, and in fact, patching and updating, which we talked about a few slides ago, mitigates most of those known exploits. So if doing the patching and update is a real good way of making sure that malware can't get its hands in. But what anti-malware does do is it helps mitigate exploits where the patches don't exist yet, or where we don't even know that there's patches because they're looking for patterns. And once they see those patterns, they disrupt them. And once those patterns are disrupted, then the attacker can't get in. It also provides patch protection where patches are, exist but haven't been applied for the same reasons. And obviously, because of its the nature of it, preventing um, the installation of malware, it is really a good protection against phishing attacks because most phishing attacks start with the introduction of malware into an environment. It's not a catch-all for everything, but it is part, using anti-malware is a part of a um, overall coverage for an organization. So I've talked about Apple, but we really should talk a little bit about going beyond Apple. And interestingly enough, when I was at the Gartner Cybersecurity uh, Symposium in June of this year, in their keynote, one of the things they talked about was resilience. And, and resilience is a key component. If we think about Apple as being 98% of the protection of your threat surface, there's still an area of there's still the potential of compromise. And if we think about the fact that climbing that asymptote gets more and more expensive, at some point we have to look at it and say, maybe having a strong resilience plan, a way of recovering from something bad happening is just as important as all the work we put into pre preventing something happening in the first place. I'm not gonna go over all of what a resilience plan is, but let's just talk about two key components. The first one is backups and backups need to be online and offline disconnected. So first, we do backups for more than just cybersecurity. It's uh, cybersecurity is one of the reasons, but let's be realistic. There are often times when um, something gets installed or some hardware breaks or something happens where we need to go back to a, a safe environment that existed pr pr prior to that event. And that's why we do online backups. But we have to keep in mind that if we are uh, attacked by a ransomware, what they're going to do is encrypt everything. And that includes our online backups. So what we want to do is create offline backups that are disconnected so that the um, adversary doesn't have the ability to completely disrupt us. And we can use one of those offline backups to get back online and operating properly. The second thing is we need incident discovery and response plans. We need to know what is what are we going to do when something goes wrong, and we need to figure that out before something goes wrong. So we're not trying to figure it out during the crisis. And so there there are many ways to do this, but the simplest is to have table talk exercises that say I had this event occur, and when that event occurred, this is how we this theoretical event, this is how we're going to respond to it. These are the people that we're going to get involved. And then 
with that plan drawn up, make sure that you have all of the information you need to actually implement that plan, like who to call, when to when to call those people, and how those things are uh, implemented. Um, you really can't do incident discovery without some kind of monitoring software. And so one of the other things that goes beyond Apple is how, how are we doing monitoring? And I'm going to talk broadly about monitoring, but some of the key things that we want to be able to do is vulnerability scanners, malware dis detection, incident discovery, and, and by incident discovery, I'm meaning things like data loss prevention, things that would give us the ability to indicate something is not right in our environment or somebody is trying to exfiltrate information out of our environment. And then when we take that information, we can use it to say, okay, well, do we need to fix things? Is there possibly that we need more access control? Is it possible that we need to have a better control of our devices? The other thing I really like having are high level metrics and dashboards. And the reason I like to do that is it gives the executive an ability to look at, well, how are we doing on key metrics that we've established for understanding how we stand for, and, and for my organization, we do at Apple. And in fact, in my organization, what I say is, I have a phrase that I use that came from uh, Bruce Clark, who was a general in the army. And the phrase is, organizations do well those things the boss checks. <clears throat> and for that reason, I check things and I check them on a regular basis. And in fact, I have a meeting every week. It alternates between cybersecurity and infrastructure with the IT department that goes over all of these dashboards and key metrics. I've talked a little bit about zero trust in this. I'm actually a really big proponent of zero trust architecture. And if you know Zero Trust Architecture and you've read NIST 800-207, um, what you'll find is that there is a lot of overlap about what Apple and what Zero Trust Architecture is trying to do. Um, the basic of Zero Trust, the basic capabilities of Zero Trust Architecture are authentication, authorization, and monitoring. And authorization is essentially limit privileges and protect resources. Those are those key components are we talked about all of those in this presentation. We've talked about them at the very basic levels. Now, if you really want to go into an advanced zero trust architecture, it's much more complicated. It would include everything in Apple and much more. And in fact, if you look at the DoD uh, zero trust roadmap, it has 152 activities and it's going to take them a decade to implement all of them. In summary, my objective was that you would better understand Apple and how it provides focus, and I hope I achieve that goal. I also hope that it helps you either directly because you look at it and say, oh, maybe I'm not doing something on this list that I should be doing in my organization, or maybe this is a way for me to communicate to my leadership things that we haven't been investing in, but we should invest in because it will provide us a lot of protection. Um, my next webinar will be a deep dive into authentication, and if you have any thoughts about that topic, please share them, and thank you, and let's get started on the Q&A. Thank you, Nat. Um, so now we'll get started on the Q&A. The first question that I have is, are there assessments or questions that I can ask leadership that help me move my organization forward to be more secure? The, the first thing I would ask the organization, or I would actually evaluate in the organization, is um, how, are we doing these all these things that are in Apple in the first place? You know, do we have a plan for doing uh, strong authentication? Are we doing patching and updating? Are we protecting resources? And do we do we have a st strategy for least privilege? Um, and are are we an enabling anti malware? And if we just go down the list, and and in fact, many times when I talk to a client. That's what I essentially do is I go down this list because it's an Apple acronym, it's really easy to remember. And so with that easy to remember acronym, I'm actually able to, to determine in that discussion, well, where should we putting, be putting money? Where should we be investing? And it really depends on where the organization is at that time. Great, thank you. The next one is out of all parts of Apple, where would you say the right place is to start? Authentication. No doubt about that. So uh, of all of these things, if you have strong phishing resistant uh, multi-factor authentication in your organization, you you are gaining the most of the benefit that you'd get from Apple and just that one capability. Um, the next one would be um, 
protecting and updating your uh, uh, patching, and updating your software. Um, I'm going to skip over protect resources and the following one would be limited privilege and enable anti malware. I'm going to say protect resources for last simply because figuring out the figuring out the you're, you're almost certainly doing something now and figuring out how to make it better is, is a pretty significant project. And so do the things that you can get done fast and easy um, and then work on the things that are hard. Great. Um, the next one is, what is the vetting process for people granted elevated access? That's a really good question. So the, the, it really comes down to your organization is going to have lots of people that fit into that category of elevated privilege. And I, I, I say lots of people at, at 2 percent, even a small organization, that's going to be quite a few people. The, the, the key thing is you should be thinking about that in the hiring process of when when I hire somebody and I know they're going to be a network admin, a system admin, even a help desk um, uh, support person. What are the attributes of that person that uh, can give me uh, comfort that they're going to use that capability responsibility? Now, a lot of times what that means is that you're hiring somebody who's got experience and who's been done doing this in the past. And when, when you're doing that, you're going to find people that have successfully used those capabilities. I think the, the bigger issue that happens with most organizations is not vetting people that have those um the people that really need those capabilities it's that they provide elevated privileges to a much larger set of people than they need and so once you start focusing it down it becomes a lot easier to say well how do we know that all of these people are doing the right thing the second part of this is that all of those people with elevated privileges should also be um keyed in in your monitoring system to make sure that you're doing extra effort to see how they're doing their job and um, are they using the privilege appropriately. Okay, next we have a question in the chat that says, can you please give us some examples of tools for micro segmentation? So micro segmentation is, uh, is, a, is a broad term for how do I create smaller and smaller buckets of uh, data that can be accessed. So as an example, if if I'm working in something like SharePoint, um, SharePoint has built into it uh, a role-based access control. And so part of doing the micro segmentation would be creating groups, and that's how you do it in Microsoft uh, uh, Azure or in, in SharePoint, and then using those groups so that only a small group can get into that access, uh, get access to that sensitive data. Um, a more sophisticated approach, and you can even do this with SharePoint, is to implement a tool like attribute-based access control. Um, and there are numerous uh, technologies that allow you to do attribute-based access control. And it then allows you to use the attributes of the subject, whoever's, whoever or whatever is trying to access the resource and the attributes of the resource and match them up with policies. But I'm going to do an entire uh, presentation on that protecting resources. And when I do that, I'll go into detail about the different technologies and tools that we can use for doing that fine grain access control. Awesome. Thank you. Um, the next one is what would I need to do to protect the last 2%? So protecting the last 2% is protecting the last 2% is really going into more sophisticated ways to do protecting resources, um, and which which I've already said is hard. So, by implementing attribute based access control, by implementing um, applications that help us clearly identify what is all of our uh, sensitive resources, and being able to uh, very carefully control that, and also control for insider threat, which is a, a, another problem which we didn't talk about here. But we also would get into more sophisticated monitoring tools, and those more sophisticated monitoring tools give you an insight into what's going on in the environment. Um, I didn't get into this in this discussion, but the, the tools for seeing what's happening on a network and being able to filter out that which is not relevant 
from the things that are really important are getting incredibly good. And so moving up that slope is pretty much a combination of how do I do more to protect my resources? Um, and that's an access control function. And how do I do better monitoring so that I can see what's going on in the environment and then take uh, proactive action to prevent uh, bad things from happening? Thank you. Um, the next one is, is monitoring in effect the critical task for resilience? Um, another really, really good question. So, and in fact, when I was doing the presentation, I was trying to think, well, should I do monitoring first or resilience first? Because they're kind of tied to one another. Um, it's really kind of hard to do incident discovery when you don't have a monitoring tool. And so they're both important. And as I said, the monitoring technology has gotten really, really good. And so the, um, and a key component of doing that monitoring is to understand what's going on in the environment so that you can take action. And yes, monitoring is a key component because, and, and I'll, let me use an example of, let's say that a, uh, an adversary has successfully breached your organization and they're starting to do a ransomware attack, but your monitoring figures out very quickly that it's happening. And it gives the, the monitoring tool the opportunity to automatically lock things down so that the, the um, malware can't um, spread, but it also gives the organization a heads up that something is going on, and then they can then go in and prevent that um, that the, that infection from spreading. And and in fact, I've had discussions with organizations that have had that exact scenario where something started. They were able to see that it was starting, see that it was happening, and very quickly be able to contain it and thus limit the blast radius of the problem. And monitoring is a key component of how, of doing that. So we have another question that touches on resilience. Um, what is the definition of resilience? Is re resilience defined by having a plan for the potential things to go wrong? That could go wrong. Yeah, basically resilience is how do how can I get my computer environment, my the entire environment back to a stable state that it was in at, at, at before the incident occurred? Um, it would also be that I have a uh, a process for dealing with things that may have been um, that may have occurred due to that um, event, whatever that event was. And and I'll give an example. Um, one of the incidents that your any organization that's doing monitoring is going to run into is what I call insider threat. And invariably what happens is that an employee who's working in the organization and may have worked on intellectual property or sensitive data decides that when they leave the organization, they're going to try and take it with them. So ideally you prevent that from happening and you prevent that from happening because you're doing the protecting resources that we discussed. However, that's not always possible and it doesn't always occur. And so part of your incident response plan may be that you take you that you get um, uh, legal involved and that that legal then is able to then um, use the tools that uh, that are afforded to lawyers to convince the person to either return that information or destroy it so that it is no longer a problem. Great, we have time for one more question. How much do implementing these changes cost an organization? Well, that's a really good question. And I, I kind of tried to highlight that in my asymptote um, point at the very beginning. So let's let's kind of talk about some of them um, in, uh, in, in, the, in, in pieces. So when I say using um, authentication um, with uh, phishing resistant authentication and for the major platforms for collaboration, both Google and Microsoft, they have built in tools that come with their products that allow you to do phishing resistant multi-factor authentication. Now they might have a small additional cost, but they're not a lot. Um, patching and updating is an inherent part of doing your infrastructure cost. That should be something you're doing already. And so if 
if you're not doing, is that really a cybersecurity cost or is that an infrastructure cost that needs to be happening? I'm going to skip to protect resources for a minute and go to limited privilege. This is just a matter of a policy decision and an implementation of how do we limit the amount of people that have uh, elevated privileges. And so that really doesn't have a really high cost. And most organizations are already using some sort of anti-malware. So that cost is probably built in. So the big costs are, well, if I'm going to do protecting resources much better than I'm doing it now, that's going to add costs. And the other thing that's going to add cost is more and more sophisticated monitoring. And so, and those are things that can be planned um, and implemented over time. Thank you, Nat, and thank you every, everyone for joining. An email um, with the link for the webinar recording will be sent out after this. Have a great day.